So before I sort of get into the details of this, I, I wanted to, um, to sort of take a step back and define science, to say essentially what it is and what it isn't. So this from Edmund Wilson's Consilience, science is the systematic enterprise of gathering knowledge about the world and organizing and condensing that knowledge into testable laws and theories. So the, the key word there is testable. I mean, you can determine whether or not, for example, MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causes autism. Um, that can be determined in a scientific venue. It's distinct from how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. That's not a scientific question. It's a theological question. It is not going to be answered in a scientific venue. And so what we do as scientists is we formulate a hypothesis, establish burdens of proof, subject those proofs to statistical analysis. Science is basically a study of controls where we, that allows one to isolate the effects of a single variable. What it isn't is it isn't scientists, it isn't scientific bodies, or it isn't accumulated knowledge. I mean, science is really just a way of thinking about or approaching a problem. I mean, sci as we learn, as we go, scientists are willing to take textbooks and throw them over their shoulders without a backward glance. I mean, scientists get it wrong all the time, but that's okay, because science is enormously self-correcting. So I'll give you some examples. In 1926, Johannes Fibiger, believed that Spidoptera carcinoma, a worm he had identified, caused cancer, for which he won the Nobel Prize, even though, as it turned out, that was dead wrong. In 1935, Igaz Moniz, a Portuguese neurologist, created a surgical cure for a variety of psycho, psycho, psychiatric illnesses. He called it leucotomy. When it crossed the Atlantic Ocean, the name was changed to lobotomy where 20,000 lobotomies were performed. Interestingly, 7,000 were performed by one man, a man named Walter Jackson Freeman, who lived not that far from here. He was a Philadelphian, went to Episcopal Academy, um, and he uh, did far more harm than good as lobotomies uh, basically faded away. The last lobotomies were done in the 1970s. Ansel Keys, in 1957, created what he called the Heart Healthy Diet. He was a, he was a famous nutritionist. He headed uh, a World Health Organization consulting groups, um, and as well as to the United Nations. Um, he believed that, that saturated fats were bad, that unsaturated fats were good, and that therefore butter, which you know, was, contained animal fat and, and therefore saturated fats, was bad. And he drove us then into, the, into margarine, which was partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, um, which was loaded with trans fats um, and was estimated by the Harvard School of Public Health to account, have accounted for about 250,000 heart-related events every year and ultimately caused Time Magazine to change its cover. <laughs> and then this one is one you might remember, um, Stanley Pons on the left, who actually looks remarkably like Bill Gates, but he's not, um, and Marty Fleischman on the right were chemists at the University of Utah who believed that if you took a, um, a palladium wire, um, attached it to a battery, put it into heavy water, so-called deuterium, that you could cause two small nuclei to fuse to form a larger nucleus which released energy. Um, this is exactly what happens on the sun, except the difference was they did this at room temperature. And the name for this, the hyphenated name for this was? Cold fusion, that you guys know. And this too died the death it deserved. I mean, it should have bothered people that this bro violated the first law of thermodynamics, which is that you can't get more energy out of something than you put into it, um, and, uh, which is why you'll never see a perpetual motion machine. Um, but in any case, it didn't. We wanted to believe this. We wanted to, this was right around the time, if you remember, of the Exxon Valdez disaster, and we wanted to believe that there was the possibility of a clean, limitless source of energy, even though it didn't make a whit of physiological sense. But I think, I think people are upset by this. I think the fluidity of science, the fact that it is always self-correcting, is dis disconcerting. And so, for example, what I would call the Bones-McCoy seduction. <laughs> So Bones McCoy, for those of you who remember, was the chief medical officer on the USS Enterprise. When he, you had a particular set of signs and symptoms, he did this. If you look in his hand, he has something called a tricorder. He would sort of scan you up and down. He would then look at the readout, and that's what you had. There was no doubt about it. And, and you know, I think, I think if you ask people today whether or not we're going to know more about science and health than we do now, a hundred years from now, will we know more? I think most people would say, yes, we will know more, but when it comes to your illness, you would like to believe we know everything we need to know now, even though that's not true. And so I think what, what ends up happening is that we're seduced by the guru. And so Mehmet Oz is, is a guru. I mean, he doesn't express doubt. He, he says things in absolutely certain terms. He's launched here by Oprah Winfrey. Um, 
Deepak Chopra also sort of functions in many ways as, as a guru, and even somebody like Andrew Wakefield, who was of the belief that the combination of measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused autism, remains a guru, even though there are now 17 studies that have clearly shown you were at no greater risk of getting autism if you got this vaccine or if you didn't. Still, there, he has his followers. And if you, if you watch him sort of go from, uh, from venue to venue, and there was a movie called The Pathological Optimist that actually launched uh, last year briefly. It didn't get much of a run. But if you watch that movie, you'll see that, that people treat him as a god in many ways. I mean, they, they sort of gather around him and just want to touch the hem of his coat. Sort of stick to the New Testament analogies, but 